Good morning, church. Really glad that you can join us to celebrate Jesus, our Savior, in this space. You know, I'm reminded of the verse that says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we quote the scripture, but you know when you need joy the most is when you're lacking joy. When you've got a joy deficiency, that's when you need the joy of the Lord. The same way when you are tired is when you need rest. When you're anxious, you need peace. And so I pray that whatever you need today, as you worship with us, as you pray with us, as you listen to the word with us, that you would receive from the Holy Spirit whatever you need to sustain you, whatever you're lacking, that you would get whatever you need to sustain you for this coming day and coming week and months ahead. God bless you. Let's worship together.
for this moment right now we thank you for a moment like this lord jesus we cry out to you now god and we give you everything we are lord we want more of you god fill us with your spirit wherever we're watching this from world whatever hour this is that we're watching this god we pray that you come into the room lord god and fill us with your spirit lord for where your spirit is and where your presence is there's freedom and sickness will vanish in the hopeless situations, Lord, they become hopeful, Lord God, for you are there. The dead will rise, and the impossible becomes possible with you there, Lord Jesus. We surrender ourselves to you now, God. Thank you, God, for this moment. A huge thank you, as always, to our worship team for leading us into the presence of God. Now, we have two special prayer requests that we're going to pray for now. Uh, first of all, we have a prayer request from one of our frontline doctors we're working in uh, our local hospital. Uh, it says, Dear Pastors Nick and Janice, things are not great in our place. All staff are burnt out and exhausted. There are too many uh, COVID cases and COVID deaths. Patient numbers are mounting. Uh, we currently have 40 on life support system and increasing whilst those on support are slow to recover. Our staff resources are depleting too. 
the ICUs across the nation, the intensive care units, is beyond capacity. 312 patients where there are only 270 ICU places. Locally, we have 41 patients on ICU support. Staff across the board are getting sick, and so uh, we are hard pressed on every side. Also, medical staff are suffering from PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I lead a crew who have not stopped since March, and most haven't had any holidays and a break. All available ventilators are in use, and this wave has been the likes of a tsunami. So we're gonna pray for our frontline health workers now. Lord, we pray uh, for our doctors and our nurses, not just those that are part of our fellowship here, but every fr health, frontline health worker, oh Lord. And we pray for strength, and we pray for courage, and we pray, pray for protection, and we pray for refreshment for them in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray that you would bring a divine turnaround in this pandemic and the effects it is having on the people who are most sick and those who are caring for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Also, we are going to pray for one of our sister churches, the Church of God in Nace, County Kildare. Uh, this is a Portuguese language church uh, composed of members of the Brazilian community. I will never forget the first time that I ministered in this church. Uh, they, they, there was nobody there had enough English to be able to translate. So I actually, at that time, we had a lady, Katrina Oliveira, who uh, was Angolan. And I realized they spoke Portuguese in Angola. So I took her with me and I thought, this is mad. I'm in County Kildare. I'm an Irishman preaching to Brazilians through an Angolan interpreter. Uh, but praise God, the church has kept growing and going since that time. Uh, the, the, they, they have wonderful leaders, Gilvaldo and Rose Oliveira. And uh, we are, we've been praying for them on many occasions uh, in Solid Rock Church. But this week, they had a fire uh, affected their church building. In fact, it destroyed everything. Everything except the pulpit was destroyed. All the equipment, the chairs, the, the PA equipment, the musical instruments, everything all destroyed. The, the building is beyond, uh, looks like it's beyond repair. Uh, it's a devastating blow to this church, and uh, we really need to pray for them. And I also want to say, if you would like to give towards this church, now, thank God they had insurance on their contents in the building. But as soon as the lockdown is over, they're going to be having to locate a new building. They're going to have all the expenses associated with that and uh, putting down deposits and everything else. I mean, it, it's just a hugely expensive process. So even with the insurance that they should be able to claim, they still stand in need of help. And uh, I would ask if you can help with that, because we have some wonderful giving people in Solid Rock, Drogheda, that if you can help with the NACE Church of God after that fire, I thank God nobody was hurt. But if you can give to that, just give to the church as you normally do on, on online or through PayPal. Uh, but just put NACE on it, N-A-A-S. Uh, if you put that somewhere attached to your electronic giving, uh, we will make sure that everything given in that way goes to the Church of God in Nace to help them move on uh, from this setback that they've received this week. But Lord, we pray for Gilvaldo and Rose and all the workers there, and we pray, Lord, that you will just strengthen them. They will not be discouraged by this setback, but Lord, they will be their their vision and their purpose will be renewed and strengthened in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to have a testimony now from one of our pastors, Seamus Burke, on what it means for him to be led by the Spirit. After that, we'll have a special song and then we'll share the Word of God together. Good morning. It's good to be with you. As you know, our theme for this year has been led by the Holy Spirit. And I've noticed that for many people, we seem to have got into the mindset that the Holy Spirit is only interested in the so-called spiritual aspects of our lives. But here, that's entirely not the case. The Holy Spirit is interested in leading us in every area of our lives. And just to illustrate that, 
I'm going to tell you a short story of our family's experience of being led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, our firstborn was about a year old when we discovered that some additional family members needed to come and live with us for a prolonged period. Now, at the time, we'd just taken out a mortgage on our house, and obviously with a, a young child, expenses were very, very severe, particularly so because mortgage rates at the time were 17.5%. So in today's terms, that's ridiculous. But we were struggling to keep all of these things going, and now we were going to have additional expense of some additional people coming to stay. But the main problem was our car was too small. It literally was too small to accommodate two additional people with a child seat in the back. It was one of those tiny little Fiat cars, two doors, no boot. And we realized we needed to get something bigger and safer. So uh, having visited all the local garages here around the Drawhead area, we could find nothing within our price range. In fact, uh, they were way beyond our price range. So we, we, we were praying about it and asking the Lord, what are we going to do? Because this is a genuine need. And I woke up one morning with the impression that we needed to go to a garage in Finglas in Dublin called Finglas Motors. They were the main Fiat dealer. So we drove down there one afternoon went into the showroom, looked around, saw nothing we could afford, met with a salesman, explained what we were looking for. And he said, look, I'm going to take your car, get it examined by the mechanics, and we'll decide whether uh, it's even something we'll take and it's trade in. And uh, I felt convicted by the Holy Spirit to tell him that whereas the speedometer was working, it wasn't properly recording the miles and that there possibly was up to ten or 15,000 additional miles on the car beyond what was being shown on on the actual mileometer. But anyway, he persuaded us while he was doing this to take one of his uh, his, uh, showroom cars. It it was a demo model for a drive. He says, you might as well have the experience while you're waiting. So we took him at his word, took this car for a drive. It was way beyond anything we imagined we could afford. But when we came back, he sat us down and did the figures. And he gave us a trade in price that we couldn't believe on our car, way beyond anything we were getting anywhere else. And the price of the new car with a small loan from the credit union was actually affordable. And we came home rejoicing at what the Lord has done. Now, I'm telling you this because I want you to know the Holy Spirit is interested in every area of your life and he seeks, he seeks to guide you in all of your ways. So I'm, I'm encouraging you today, expect to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Present your needs to the Lord and listen because he wants to direct your paths.
Our theme in this church for 2021, as you probably know by now, is led by the Spirit. And we're sharing teaching, we're sharing encouragement, we're sharing testimony on how we can all be led by the Spirit of God in a fresh way and a new way this year. Now, uh, being led by the Holy Spirit must impact on all areas of our lives. Uh, if You know, sometimes in our lives we have blind spots, and I hope you understand what I mean by a blind spot. Uh, sometimes if you're driving a car, there's a blind spot that you look at your mirror, you can see what's behind you, you can, you, you know, but it doesn't catch everything. And, and just somehow the way your seat is uh, situated, the height you are in the car, the way the mirror's positioned, the way the windows are on the car, there can be a blind spot where you don't see a vehicle alongside you if it's in your blind spot. And blind spots are tremendously dangerous because if you ignore blind spots, you are likely to end up in an accident and it could it could be deadly, it could be fatal. And so we ignore blind spots at our peril. And so it is with being led by the Spirit of God. It's, it's not enough to find one or two areas of your lives where you're led by the Spirit of God. It's not, it's not enough just to be led in what we think are the spiritual things. We've got to be led by the Holy Spirit in all areas of our lives. And we can't afford to have any blind spots in our lives when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And today I'm going to speak about spirit-led giving. Now, of all the areas of life that the Bible speaks about, uh, there are two that cause the most controversy when pastors speak on them, and that is sex and money. Uh, whenever, any time we talk about sex and we talk about biblical teaching on sex, uh, even if we only do it once every, once a year, people say, that's all, all this church, why are Christians so obsessed with sex? And generally the people who say that, uh, it's because they've got things in their lives that are contrary to God's purposes for intimacy in our lives. And so they project it back on the church. How come they're always talking about it, even if we hardly ever mention it? So that's one one sensitive area. And the other one is when we talk about money. And I guess the reason for this is because sex and money uh, are very strong motivational forces in people's lives. Uh, it, homicide detectives tell us that two of the most common motivations for people to commit murder, to go beyond normal bounds of morality and conscience are, are sex and money. These are powerful, motivating factors. Money and possessions are a huge part of most of our lives. They, they di often dictate where you live, uh, what job you work in, what days you work and don't work. Uh, all, all, all of these, even rows in families, are often centered around money and possessions. And it's an area that the Bible teaches about and Jesus taught about. You know, Jesus talked more about money and possessions than he did about heaven or hell. And and yet I've never heard somebody say, you know, the problem with that Jesus is he was always talking about money. <laughs> so why, if people don't have a problem with Jesus talking about money, why, why do they have a problem when churches talk about money? Now, listen, I'm talking about genuine problems here. I just want to say this in passing, that uh, to be honest, if somebody is being led by the Spirit in the area of giving, and they are a giving person and a generous person, and they were to come to me and say, Nick, the church talks too much about money, I would really want to talk to them more and sit down and listen to what they have to say and really go through self-examination. Now, I have found that there are a cohort of people, and I've talked with other pastors and found they experience the same thing. There is a kind of person who is ready to start criticizing churches every time they talk about money, and these people themselves are not giving people. I mean, they they never give anything to anyone. Often they, they don't even support themselves financially. They spend their lives living off other people, and yet they're very quick to criticize churches for teaching about finance. So obviously when those kind of people 
want to start making criticisms about the church, I'm not very inclined to listen, no more than I would listen to somebody who's living in adultery telling me about how I should conduct my marriage or my, or be my personal intimacy with my wife. And in the same way, I'm not going to, if somebody is obviously not being led by the Holy Spirit when it comes to their own financial affairs, then I really don't feel they got a lot to say to the church. But if somebody who has obviously been led by the Spirit were to say to me, you know, the church, the, the teaching on finances is, is unbalanced, is something wrong, I would really want to listen to them. But why is it that people are much quicker to dislike it when churches speak about finance whenever they don't have a problem with Jesus speaking about it? And, and I think one reason is a lack of trust in a preacher's motivation. Because I'm going to be honest with you, often in churches, people do teach on finances for the wrong motivation. I, I, I've been a Christian now for nearly 40 years. Next month, it will be 40 years since I gave my life to Jesus. And I've heard a lot of teaching in churches that was obviously coming from a wrong motivation. You know, it's it's easy sometimes for people when they're when they're struggling financially to start looking at things in an unbalanced way. Uh, I, I remember there have been times in my life whenever as a, somebody in full-time ministry, I, I somehow felt that the financial shortfalls we were experiencing in our household were because the people in the church weren't giving enough. And I had to come to a revelation and really repent of that attitude because if there was a problem with my finances, it probably had more to do with my giving than anybody else's giving. And once I stopped looking at other people's giving and concentrated on giving to the Lord and be allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me in my giving, both to the church and to others, uh, do you know what? I found God really began to move in blessing in my life. The problem was not with other people's giving. The problem was with my giving and I had to acknowledge that and not even just the amount I gave but how I gave and the and the heart and the attitude with which I gave. But also I've often heard it said in churches whenever a church is under financial pressure somebody says maybe we should teach more about finances but you know what that that's wrong. We shouldn't teach on finances because the church is doing bad financially and we need to try and get some more money out of people. That's probably the worst time to speak about finances because it's it's going to come across from the wrong motivation. So people are often wary of churches teaching, teaching about finances because they doubt their motivation. Another fact is that the majority of church teaching on finance and giving that I've heard has not actually been spirit-led. It has been need-driven. Whenever we need this for the church, we need this for the land. Now, let's talk about tithing. Or sometimes not even need-driven, but greed-driven. Uh, it, it's Thankfully, we don't see as much of this in Ireland as we do in some other countries. Uh, but I, I, I want to tell you, you watch Christian television at all and just surf through the channels and you will see a lot of greed driven teaching in regards to giving and finance. And, and it's horrible and it's shameful and it really uh, is, is a it's a barrier that turns people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then there's teaching on finance from churches that is law driven. It's about keeping the law. So, for example, teaching on tithing. If you, you know, I've heard people teach, if you don't tithe, you're going to be cursed with a curse. We are not under the law. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I believe in tithing, but not because it's a law and not because I'm under a law, but because I believe that tithing is a good basis uh, for me in my giving as a minimum as to how I should give to the Lord and then the Spirit leads me on beyond that. But uh, when, we, when we reduce giving to trying to avoid a curse or trying to buy a blessing, then we are distorting the biblical teaching on finances and giving and that causes great damage to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, the, a lot of te church teaching on finance is either need-driven, greed 
driven or law driven. But today we are going to look at seven principles of spirit led giving. Seven biblical principles on how the spirit leads us in the area of giving and receiving. First thing I want to say is this, God is a giver and the Holy Spirit is a giver. So if we are led by the Spirit, guess what we're going to be? We're going to be givers. You see, it's we're not just talking about money. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, I know as soon as I quote that verse, there are going to be some people say, hang on, Nick, you're quoting that out of context. That's not talking about finance. It's talking about wisdom. I know that. Of course it is. But here's a truth that we've got to get a hold of. When a person is a giver in one area, they're going to be a giver in another area. If you delight in giving of your time, if you delight to giving of your attention, if you delight in giving compliments graciously to people, you will also find you are a giver in other areas of your life, including finance as well. And God is a giver of wisdom. God is a giver of salvation. God is a giver of freedom. And God is a giver of material blessings. Why? Because the important thing here is not what God gives it's who God is. He is a giver. And one of the most important things we need to learn about spirit-led giving is it's not what we give that really matters. It's that we become givers. It's not what we give, it's who we are. Just as how it's not about what God gives, but about who he is. And so if we are spirit-led, we will be givers Giving is not something we do. Being givers is something we are. Givers give. And if we are spirit-led, we are givers. Number two, God provides our needs and equips us for whatever he calls us to do. So whatever God plan, whatever plan God has for your life and whatever he wants to do through your life, he is not going to allow lack of resources to hold you back if you will trust him. And I'm not, I, you know what? It might be finances. It might be people. It might be property. It might be equipment. It, 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 it might be knowledge. Whatever it is, if God calls you to something, he will also help you receive everything you need to fulfill that calling. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, and this is talking about finance, but you can apply it to any other area of receiving from God, because remember, it's not what God gives that matters. It's the fact that he is a giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now, there's a lot of alls there in just one verse. It, it, God is able to bless you in abundantly in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's talking about a God who gives us what we need to fulfill whatever he calls us to do. Okay, principle number three is that there is such a thing as the spiritual gift of giving. Among the other spiritual gifts that the Bible lists, Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If, if it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I believe in the spiritual gift of giving. And I think what a wonderful gift that we should all seek and want to manifest in our lives. 
because you know what? If you're going to give, that means you got to receive in order to give. You can't exercise a gift of giving if you don't have anything to give. You know, God wants us to freely receive. He wants us to freely give and he wants to release a gift of giving in the church. And I've prayed and I've said, Lord, would you please give me the gift of giving? Now, some of those there, you know, that I've mentioned there, gift of teaching, encouragement and, and leading and showing mercy. Uh, yeah, I want to do what they're prophesying. I, I want to move in those gifts, but I want to move in the gift of giving. And to do that, I've got to be led by the Holy Spirit because giving is a spiritual gift. Principle number four. It is better to give than to receive. In Acts 20, verse 35, In everything I did, I showed you by, by, that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's true. You know, we've not long ago, we celebrated Christmas. I I love giving gifts at Christmas. Now, receiving gifts is nice. And, you know, when when I sit with the family and Christmas morning, we all start opening our presents. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's nice to get a nice gift. But I want to tell you something. I get much more excited about the gifts I give than the gifts I receive. Whenever I watch somebody's face as they open the gift I've given them and and see the the pleasure, the excitement, sometimes the surprise. That gives me far more joy than any gift I would receive from anyone on Christmas morning because it is better to give than to receive. Every, every parent understands this. When it comes to your relationship with your child, it's nice when your child gives you something, but it's much better when you give something to your child. It is better to give than to receive. And when we are led by the Spirit of God, giving is the number one thing. Receiving, yeah, that, that's necessary. We need to receive in order to give. But you know, I've heard so much teaching on giving that is really more about receiving. Well, you've, if you give this, you will be so blessed. You will have this, you will have that, you will have the other. And it's an appeal to people's desire to receive. And the fact is, if we give, we do receive. I do believe that. That is a principle. But we've got to understand and we've got to know and we've got to walk in the experience and the motivation that it is better to give than to receive. Why? Because God delights to give. God, God likes to receive. God likes to receive your worship. God likes to receive your thanksgiving. He right, likes to receive your love. He likes to receive your repentance whenever we sin. But you know what? God delights in giving to you more than he could ever delight in receiving anything from you, because it's better to give than to receive. And if we are led by the Spirit of God, who is himself a giver, we will prefer giving to receiving. Principle number five, Spirit-led giving exceeds driven giving. When people are giving because it's need-driven or greed-driven or law-driven, our spirit-led giving is never an excuse to give less. When we move from trying to obey a law about tithing to actually being led by the Spirit to give, we will never end up giving less than the person who's under the law, but we will end up giving more. You know, what, what I have experienced in my own heart is that tithing for me, tithing makes sense, not as a law, not because you're cursed if you don't do it or anything else, but because tithing is a beautiful way that a community of God's people can work together. Because when it comes to the church, I mean, I, I had somebody was in touch with me this week and they were just uh, asking me, you know, they were, they were really asked me to pray for them and saying that uh, they're in a position right now where they have literally no income whatsoever, really, really minimal income. But the wonderful thing is about tithing is the person that's really on almost no income gives as much as the millionaire who tithes, because it's not actually about the 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 euro and the cent. 
it's about the heart in the giving. And the wonderful thing about tithing is it doesn't mean that rich people are more important in the church than, than those that aren't rich in, in material things. It means that we all play an equal part and we all contribute. And uh, when we do that, we're in it together and there's a shared responsibility and, and there's a shared ownership of what goes on in the kingdom of God. And that's a beautiful thing in a church. And I believe in that with all my heart. And so I do believe that uh, that when we give as a church, for example, the Bible says we will be blessed. You know, in Malachi, when it says about if we bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, God will open the windows of heaven. It's not saying, hey, you, if, if you, Farmer Joe, that's got a, a field of corn uh, one kilometer from Jerusalem, that direction, if you tithe, then the windows of heaven are going to open up over Farmer Joe's field and miss everybody else's field. That's not what the scripture is saying. It's saying this, that if the people of God are a tithing community, then God opens the windows of heaven and blesses the entire community. And I do believe this, that when God's church is a tithing church, God blesses the church. It's, it's not about me saying, me, Nick, I, I've got to tithe, otherwise I won't be blessed and I'll be cursed. But if I tithe, oh, I'm going to have loads of money in my account. No, it's, it's not saying that. It's saying that if I, as part of God's people, I'm part of a tithing community, then God's going to open the windows of heaven over his church. And I don't know about you, but I love the church. I love being part of the church of Jesus Christ. I love sharing with my brothers and sisters in the church. And being part of a church that has an open heaven, when it comes to praying for people to be healed, to know we've got the windows of heaven opened. Whenever we're, whenever we're trying to help people going through really difficult periods right now during a pandemic, when people are on this pandemic unemployment payment and uh, whenever there's national debt ramping up and people are not quite sure what the future holds, I tell you what, we want to be living under an open heaven. I want to be part of a tithing church. Because I want the church to be blessed. But here's what I've discovered, that when we are led by the Spirit, we do more than when we are under the law. I mean, this is what Jesus said. You know, he, he said that, uh, he, he said that you, should, you know, under the law, you should love your neighbors. He said, but whenever you are being led by the Spirit, you love your enemies as well. He said that under the law, you don't commit adultery. He said, but when you are led by the Spirit, then you realize you don't even want to think about adultery. It's not, it goes way beyond the standard of the law because the Spirit will never make us less righteous than the law. The Spirit will always make us more righteous than the law does. That's why Jesus said your righteousness will exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees if you're going to live in the kingdom of God. And it's the same with our giving. When we are led by the Spirit to give, and it's a joyous thing, not a duty bound, oh, I gotta give, but at least I'll be blessed back. No, it's a, it's a joyous thing. And whenever we are led by the Spirit to be givers, as God is a giver, then we always give more than if we were trying to comply with a law. We, we always give more when we are spirit-led than when we are need-driven, greed-driven, or law-driven. So spirit-led giving exceeds driven giving. Principle number six of our seven principles of spirit-led giving. Spirit-led giving creates a joyous community. This is what I was talking about, the open heaven. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10, Nehemiah said to the people, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our God. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I love the way that scripture ties giving to others. If you've, if you've got food prepared to feast and celebrate, that's wonderful, he says. But there are people who haven't. So send something to those that haven't got anything to celebrate with. And let's celebrate together because the joy of the Lord is our strength. 
whenever you have a church that is led by the Spirit in their giving, then you know what? You will have joy in that church because Spirit-led giving creates a joyous community of God's people. And the church is not supposed to be miserable. The church is not supposed to be boring. It's not to be, supposed to be the place where you go to get depressed. The church should be a center of joy in Jesus' name. And the seventh principle of spirit-led giving is this. Spirit-led giving is like an iceberg. When you see an iceberg floating in the sea, the bit that you see above the water is much smaller than the bit of the iceberg that is below the water. And when we are led to give by the Holy Spirit, what we give to the church is not the be all and end all. Because under the surface, like the rest of the iceberg, there's all the giving that we end up doing in other ways. I delight in the fact whenever I hear about people in our church who give, they're led by the Spirit to, to give. They, they give their tithes and offerings in church, but they give to charities. They get involved in all kinds of projects. They're blessing people left, right, and center. They're working and, and working with children with special needs and all kinds of things. Why? Because they're giving people. And I do believe this, that God wants the church to be the, I once heard a pastor say this, and it's dreadful English, but it's great theology. He said, we need to be the givingest church. I don't even think there is such a word as givingest. But I want, I want us to be the most, the givingest church around. Why? Because when we, when we are led by the Spirit, it doesn't only mean we give in the church giving. It means that we give in the other areas of our lives as well. Because remember, it's not what we give, it's who we are when we are led by the Spirit. And thank God, this is actually statistically proven that people who give money to churches give more to charities than people that don't even go to church. So, so just think about that for a moment. On average, somebody who is already giving to their church will give more money to secular charities and appeals going on, whether it's Down Syndrome Ireland, whether it's a Tear Fund, whether it's Concern, whether it's another relief agency or whatever. People who are already giving to their church give more to these other things than people that never go to a church or give to a church. Why? It's the iceberg principle at work. Because when the Holy Spirit is doing something in your life, it works in all areas of your life. And therefore, giving is not just about what we put in an envelope or pay by a standing order to the church. Giving is how we live our lives and it will sh shine through in all the areas of our lives. And I just want to ask you a question. Don't you want to belong to a church that is full of those kind of givers? Do you want to be one of those kind of givers yourself? I know I, I want to be one of those kind of givers. I want to be one of the most givingest people on earth. Not because I'm trying to amass riches or I see it as some high interest bank account, but because I want to be more like Jesus. And I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I want to be led by the Holy Spirit when it comes to my giving. I'm just going to pray for each of us now. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the wonderful truth that the Holy Spirit is leading us. That the Holy Spirit does not mark off areas of our lives to say, oh, not interested in that. That's nothing to do with God. But I thank you, Lord, that you want to transform every area of our lives, including our giving. Lord, I thank you because I see so much evidence of you already working in people's lives in, in this way in the church. But I pray you would increase that. I pray we'd find a greater joy in being giving people. I pray, Lord, that together we would, we would be able to do things that people thought were absolutely impossible because we're being led by the Holy Spirit in our giving. And I pray that our giving will be a blessing, not just in religious stuff and in the church, but I pray that our giving will be a blessing to our community 
and to our nation and to our world. For I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. In a few minutes, we're going to close our service uh, by saying the grace together. But before we do, just got a few notices I, I want to share with you. Uh, please do remember to pray for our frontline health workers, as we've already said. And please do pray for the Church of God in NACE following that devastating fire that they've had. And again, if you would like to give, just uh, do regular and give in the way you normally give to the church, but mark it NACE, N-A-A-S. And we will make sure that everything that's given in that way goes to the Church of God in NACE at their time of need. Uh, don't forget that uh, we are under level five restrictions, as everybody knows. So there's no church services in person at the moment. Uh, so everything we're doing is online. And you can access our online content at our website, www.solidrock.ie, or at our Facebook page, Solid Rock Drogheda. Uh, we have our Take 5, a daily devotional, a five-minute inspirational message that is posted up every day, uh, Monday to Saturday. So do check that out. Uh, also, with something new happening, starting uh, on Monday the 8th of February, we are starting a five-week Bible study on the book of Ephesians. Uh, this is using uh, course materials developed by the Irish Bible Institute in Dublin. And it's going to be at 7.30 p.m. It's going to take place through Zoom. And if you would like to be a part of that study, uh, why not get, get express an interest in it now? Uh, there's a special email address that you can uh, send to. It is courses, C-O-U-R-S-E-S, -E courses at solidrock.ie. And if you would just send your name and your email address, your phone number, whatever, uh, to that, uh, we will be back in touch with you, given all the details, how you can access course materials online, to give you the Zoom link for, for tomorrow week, for, for Monday the 8th of February, uh, so that you can participate in that. But we'd, please do consider it's a great way to interact with other people from the church and study the Word of God. Uh, on Wednesday, we do have our Wednesday night at The Rock online. And uh, with that continues this coming Wednesday, continuing to look at the subject of God of our fathers. That's at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, on Saturday, our children's uh, church service goes live at uh, 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And all these things, you know, although they start at this time, they're then on YouTube. So you can watch them anytime you want. And of course, next Sunday's service, we make it, uh, we put it live on the Internet at 9 a.m., but uh, it's going to then be up there so you can watch it whenever. In fact, I would encourage you, if you really, if you can, to watch it at either 10 a.m. or 12 noon, because that's when most other people are watching it at those regular service times. So you're actually watching the service at the same time as other people, even if you can't see, see their face. Uh, so that's Sunday service live from 9 a.m., but uh, I encourage you to watch it at 10 or 12 if you can. Uh, don't forget, we our 24-7 prayer is still continuing. In fact, there's more people getting involved. I, I'm seeing an increasing enthusiasm for the 24-7 prayer, uh, booked up days in advance. Uh, and I would encourage you just to just to book in for an hour, even if somebody else's name is already down, you can be praying at the same time as them. Sometimes we've got two, three more people praying uh, in, for an hour's slot. But we are covering the the, the, the clock all around the clock, 24-7. Uh, we've been praying non-stop now since St. Patrick's Day and 10 months in now, and it's it's increasing by the grace of God. We're not running out of fire for prayer. We're increasing in passion. So please do check that out. Through The, the link is on the web page or on the Facebook page. Finally, thank you for your giving to the church. As always, it is a blessing. Uh, thank God I'm not standing preaching because the finances are bad. That's not why I'm having to teach about finances today. We're blessed. We're, we're, meet, we're paying our bills at a time. I would never have believed it possible that we could be closed so many Sundays and we still pay the bills. We still pay the mortgage. We still pay everything. And it's through the faithful giving of God's people. Uh, the numbers up on the screen, if you like want to give online, there's the IBAN and the big number and whatever else you need. Um, uh, or there's a there's a PayPal link on the on on our website, 
but however you choose to give or if you just choose to save it all up your offering your envelopes up and whenever we meet again in person bring them along in a thanksgiving offering to the lord that that's just great whatever way you're giving thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for being led by the spirit in jesus name let's close with the grace and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now and forevermore. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week. We love you. Take care.